Mark chapter 14. We're going to be looking at verses 22 through 31. Mark 14, verses 22 through 31. There's actually a long-standing tradition for a lot of Jews getting ready um, for the Passover to use something called a Haggadah, which is a small booklet. It contains the various prayers and customs and orders for celebrating Passover. And they get that actually from Maxwell House Coffee, of all places, of all things. And if we were in a larger Jewish community, you would probably already know that because you would go to the store, see the coffee, and either have it packaged there together already or have it, you know, kind of like on a stand near there, something along those lines. And so you would see that in these various other places. We don't do that here because, of course, we're not a large Jewish community. But in other places, you would do that. And I'm told that if you, if you uh, purchase the Maxwell House or whatever, you can actually send for that Haggadah and get that and just have kind of a, a little bit of a reference guide or something to kind of page through, work through if you're ever interested in that and, uh, and enjoy that for what it is. But for many Jews, nothing says Passover like a matzo ball, a matzo ball and a bad cup of coffee. And it makes you wonder, like, how did that association come to be? Ma- uh, Maxwell House itself isn't even a Jewish company. And the answer really lies in one word. Marketing. It's all about marketing. Maxwell House, a long time ago, wanted to inform the Jewish populace that coffee was kosher for Passover. Now, there are a lot of foods that even are maybe are typically kosher, aren't kosher for Passover. And so certain things kind of get brought off the table. The most obvious one, of course, is leavened bread. You know, take the leaven, it wasn't get it out of your bread, but it was get it out of your house. And so that was a thing for that Passover celebration, that Passover week, that was gone. It was no longer kosher for that period of time. But a lot of people would also avoid other things like rice, corn, seeds, and especially here, legumes, every single Passover. And a lot of people were taking and mistaking uh, coffee beans and legumes and think of that's not kosher, we can't have that. But it's different. So in 1923, Maxwell House set out to change that, and they did. And the original ad ran in both Hebrew and in English, and it said this, it's a mitzvah to tell you that Maxwell House coffee is kosher for Passover. Sales surged. And by 1932, they added that Haggadah, that booklet that I was telling you about earlier, free with purchase, and the tradition was born. But both coffee and this booklet became part of that tradition. And it kind of, you know, it left its mark on Passover. And for many Jews to this day, in the United States at least, that, 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 that booklet especially is kind of a Jewish Americana. It, it just goes together. It's what you do for Passover. That's the way they celebrate it with the special edition Maxwell House Coffee Haggadah that they follow. But this is not the first time that something from the outside came in and fundamentally transformed or changed Passover. Actually, it happened really once before, this time by Jesus, who really invested a whole lot another layer of meaning and kind of looked at it and, and revealed it for what it was, that it was a foreshadowing of something else. And it's at the time that Christ comes in here, he's really tearing the veil off of what Passover was always a symbol of, and kind of giving them the actual picture. This is what this was looking forward to. And Passover, what the Jews still celebrate, and what for us, the Lord's table or communion, is diverged at that point, and we see what Christ was showing us the entire time. And so he took and really fundamentally changed it, but he didn't do so in an arrogant manner, as you might say, because, I mean, here he is coming and really saying, this meal is all about me. You can imagine, if you actually think about it, like, wow, I mean, that... Most people wouldn't do that, but he did. But it wasn't out of arrogance. It was illustrative so that they and we would never forget what this was always about. And so Jesus is courageously getting ready to face a cross. And the disciples, though they don't know it, are in their arrogance about to face a chicken. The results could not be more different. We need to be accepting Christ as the hero that you aspire to be. Let's read verses 22 through 25 as we begin. And as they were eating, he took bread, and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to them and said, Take, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. And he said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly, I say to you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. 
This is Jesus and the courage before a cross, and it's the order of Passover that's important here. It's perhaps maybe a little bit easy, or, or excuse me, uh, a, a little early for Easter for us. It's still a few weeks away, so some of the, the connections here that, that Jesus would have been making just for the next couple of days, we're still a few weeks away, but we're close. But oddly enough, Passover actually starts this coming Saturday, and so this is almost a perfect fit, the way that God has worked the timing out that we can think about this. So hopefully next Saturday especially you'll think about this as the Jews around us or in this country are celebrating their Passover like we've talked about a little bit already. And we're actually picking up here right where we left off. If you remember last week, Jesus and the disciples had just offered that Passover sacrifice and in the temple that was slaughtered, they're carrying the lamb, and Jesus tells them where they can find the upper room in which they can keep it. Well, we're getting back into that upper room now, we're seeing the actual events of that Passover supper unfold. And since we being basically all uncircumcised Philistines and have no idea what a Passover really looks like, I thought it might be nice to kind of come in here and look at this a little bit for ourselves. What does a Passover look like? The order and the significance of the various things. And so I hope you'll enjoy this as we just take a moment to consider the, some of the basic elements in order for the Passover. That meal will begin with the head of that meal, in this case Jesus, actually standing and giving thanks for the Passover in general, the events that had taken place in Egypt, and the, the wine specifically. And that's important. There's a reason for that. The first, uh, the, the first four cups of wine, first of four cups of wine would be drunk at this point. And each cup of wine actually symbolized a promise that God had given to the Israelites even prior to all of the plagues and everything coming together. In Exodus 6, you might want to look at this later if you want to, but Exodus chapter 6 verses 6 through 7 actually detail the four promises that these four cups would later uh, uh, refer to. In Exodus 6, 6 and 7, say this. Say therefore to the people of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will deliver you from slavery to them. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm, with great acts of judgment. And I will take you to be my people, and I will be your God. And you shall know that I am the Lord your God, who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. So that first cup that Jesus here is taking relates to the promise that God would bring them out of Egypt. And they do this. They take these various cups and they would do this so that they would never forget these promises and God's fulfillment of those promises. Well, after consuming that first cup, and then they would sit down and actually have what we would mostly call the formal aspect of the meal. They would sit, they began uh, eating the lamb and the bread and the bitter herbs and the special sauce that kind of went with all those things. And they would consume, that was kind of the main portion of the meal. And they would eat and enjoy that. And then finally, once most of that meal was eaten at a certain time, either a son or someone who's acting in that position as a son, kind of appointed beforehand, would simply ask this question. Why is this night different from all of the others? And the head of the feast then would begin to recite the story of the Exodus, tell the story. This is what happened. This is what has led up to this event. This is what was happening the night of. This is what was happening the days after the event of the Exodus. And they would remember their history. When that was finished telling that portion of the story, they would recite then or sing really the Hallel, Psalm 113. And then the second cup would be held up and they would consume that second cup, the promise of being freed from slavery. And then the head of the feast would give thanks again. And then they would drink the third cup, a cup that reminded them that God would redeem them. And eating would resume. Then later, they would finally sing and get uh, the, the last part of the Hallel, Psalm 114 through 118, and drink the fourth cup. I will take you, and you will be my people. So it was the basic order of the events of the Passover. This is what they would celebrate every year about this time of year. That's the normal way things would go. But what we find here is the order is interrupted. It's not normal. For the most part, it was. But Jesus gets to this part, and, and he kind of goes off script. And I can imagine him taking that, that loaf of bread there in front of everybody and saying, this is my body, which is being broken for you. And then the disciples are sitting there, probably Peter, that's not how that goes. That's not, that's not what we say. That's not what we do here. That's not what the, I mean, the bread is just the bread. It's the, the sin has been removed. But the reason we have bread here this way is because there was not time for it to rise. We were in a hurry. 
that's all it was supposed to represent. But Jesus takes this bread and says, this is my body which is being broken for you. The disciples knew that that's not how it goes because this is their earliest memory. They had celebrated the Passover every single year. The way that we do with our holidays, with our holy days, we do that. We know how it goes, but most of our times when we celebrate, very rarely do we have such a formulaic way of celebrating the way that they did. They probably all had the, the events and the things that were going to be said more or less memorized at this point in time. So when Jesus goes off script, it's not an accident. It's not a mistake. He's teaching. He's teaching them. And they don't really quite get what this all means yet. But Jesus said, this is my body. Now when he says that, the question of course comes up because it actually comes from this passage. Was that literally now Jesus' body? Later, when he brings up the cup, says, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. This is my blood in this cup. Was the cup now literally containing the blood of Christ? That's a question that many people have argued over, especially sometimes depending on what denomination you happen to be from. Is that literally Christ's body? Is that literally Christ's bread? Or is it something else? Some of you know this about me, maybe not all of you, though, that my, my cousin, once removed, was actually a Catholic missionary in Japan for like 40 years Back in 1998, I think he was home and kind of retiring, and we were invited to this kind of the celebration of, of, uh, of, of his service over there in Japan. And so we went, and there was a, it wasn't the normal cathedral that my, my grandparents used to attend to. It was a different one near, closer to uh, the Philadelphia area. It was bigger. And we kind of went late, I think, on purpose. And we're standing in the back and, and listening to this, and we're watching this Mass, and, of course, the Eucharist is part of that. And it was kind of my first experience in being in a, in a formal just... Catholic service. It wasn't necessarily a funeral, but a formal Catholic service. And I'm watching them doing their thing up front, and they take the bread, and they take the cup, and they put it in the little box, and all of a sudden there's this dinging of a bell. You know, some of you have you know, come from that background. You know what that's talking about. And, then, and I'm like, this is obviously part of the service. And I'm in the back with my parents. We're standing in there. And I'm like, what was that? And my mom, who had been Catholic until somewhere in her 20s, it starts explaining to me, well, that's when they put it in the box. They ding the bell, and that, now it's transformed into the body and blood of Christ. And I said, what? I said, you're kidding me. And my parents were like, shh, because it was too loud. And, but I was like, I've never heard that before. I never heard that before. I thought, you're, you're say, say what now? That's what you think? That's what you're holding on to? But they did. They did. And, and that's what they're holding on to. And it comes from this passage. And passages, the similar, the parallels in the Gospels that Jesus said, this is my body. They're being literal. We like literal, don't we? What did he mean? Did Jesus mean that this bread was literally his body? I think I've been put it in a word. No. But we have to figure out why. We can't just say that. Why do we say that? I think first and foremost is the idea that uh, it's probably not how they would have taken it. One, in part, because he just, he's standing in front of them holding it. This is my body. Well, he's standing right there. Like, that's your body, that's the bread. There's a separation there. You're, he's right there. This is not something that's taking place after the fact. They're together. Secondly, and I think this one's important too, that, and, and it's surprising, almost certainly Jesus would have been speaking in Aramaic. You know, think of him maybe sometimes in Greek or even in Hebrew, but Jesus almost certainly would have been speaking in Aramaic. And oddly enough, Aramaic does not have any word for is. I don't know how you can like, get through life without the word is in your vocabulary, but that's not a thing. So what the disciples would have heard is, my body, bread. So not is, that equivalency that we normally associate with that word. They would have just heard, my body, bread. It would have kind of helped them understand, like representative or a metaphorical kind of an understanding. This body, or this bread symbolizes me, especially because he's standing right there. So that's what they would have heard. And thirdly, and I think this might be, might be the most powerful argument against this, as a drinking blood was so offensive to the Jews, like unbelievably offensive, that for Jesus to just kind of pass through this nonchalant the way that he does, couldn't, I mean, there's no way they would have not, that he wouldn't have had to explain this like over and over and over again to get it through, like, no, it's okay. You know what I mean? Like, think about this later on in Acts chapter 10 when Peter is there in that kind of a trance. It's right before he goes to see Cornelius and, and God lets down that sheet with all the unclean animals and tells Peter, here, kill and eat. And Peter's like incensed by this thing. He says, I can't do that. I've never eaten an unclean animal in my life. He's got a huge problem with that. And it's not because Peter's a vegan. 
eat meat all the time, just not that kind of meat. And so three times God lowers this, this, this sheet and says, don't call unclean. What I'm telling you is now clean. There's been a change. Something's happened here. We don't have that kind of a conversation here. And Peter's balking at this with just when it comes to meat, like a different kind of meat, but blood? Oh, no. And it just kind of gets passed over. So again, I think it was pretty obvious to them that they were looking at this in a metaphorical fashion because Jesus doesn't bend over backwards to convince them. that No, no, it's okay. So we see this. We see these things as being representative of the body and blood of Christ, not actually the body and blood of Christ. But what's also surprising here is the fact that Jesus picks up the bread and not the lamb to represent himself. The bread is now going to represent his death and the sacrifice of Christ. Why would he pick up the bread and ignore the lamb that's literally sitting in front of them on the table? I think this is a question that has long perplexed a lot of people, but I think that the answer may be more simple than we realize because the sacrifice, the animal sacrifices are done. There's no need. The, the, the Lamb, Jesus, is that perfect and ultimate sacrifice. Therefore, there is no more sacrifices. We do this in remembrance of Him. It may be more significant to the fact that we're not actually sacrificing anything any longer. It's done. That was what happened in the Old Testament over and over. Sacrifices were being brought. Sacrifices were being offered. But when Christ comes, He can truly say, It is finished. No more. It's done. So now we take the bread and says, this represents my body that's literally being broken for you. But there is no more sacrifice. So he ignores the lamb, even though he is the lamb of God, because he's the final sacrifice, never to be repeated. That brings us now to this idea, this kind of interweaving of these concepts and ideas. This bread, which was a part of the, of the Passover, but always a minor player, now is going to represent Christ that his body will be broken. It's unleavened. Leaven traditionally standing in for that symbol of sin. It's unleavened. Jesus is not, has no sin. He's not contaminated in that way. He can be the sacrifice that we need him to be. Then comes the cup. It's most likely the third cup in that order of service that I gave you. When we look at Exodus 6, the significance of that should stand out to us, that when he holds up that cup and he consumes that cup, it's the promise that God had given Egypt. He says, I will redeem you. Do you see the significance? She's walking through the events of these Passovers. It's the foreshadowing all leading up to this place. And Jesus holds up this cup. This is this. It's the cup of the new covenant in my blood. And it's the cup of redemption. This is what I'm doing for you. It's also, as Jesus is doing this, you realize that Jesus' death, that covenants are ended in death. The old covenant is finally coming to an end. That covenant that Israel had entered into during Exodus 20 and Mount Sinai and coming and wandering through the wilderness, covenants can be ended in death. He's dying. And with that same blood, with that same blood of redemption here now, a new covenant will also begin. Covenants were often associated with blood. It might make you wonder why, but it was just simply to act out the, the, the punishment of the covenant. If I break this, let this happen to me. You did it to the animals. If I do that, you can do that to me. You can slaughter me, so to speak. And here we have the blood of Christ on the cross, holding the cup of redemption, saying the new covenant begins now. The old one's done. new one begins. Jeremiah 31 becomes a reality. And from this moment on, they will drink it. And you think about that during the previous Passovers and other times like that, they would never drink the blood. You wouldn't think of doing that. We sprinkled, sprinkled on the people, purify the people. It was symb symbolic that way. Now they're going to be consuming it. Why? Because Jesus had given his life for them. Not only Jesus' life could do that, and it served as a reminder that something had given up its life so that they could live. You think about what happens every time that you sit down to sit, sit at a meal, especially when it comes to meat. You're eating that meat, you're eating that animal, and you're taking its life so that your life might go on. It's how it works. Something died, though, to be able to do that for you. And not just being spared. And I think the Old Covenant, uh, the Old Testament, when that blood was being sprinkled, yes, something had died for you so that you might live, but it was much more the idea of spared. You're being spared. 
death. But when you actually eat something, you're partaking in it, but it's also, it's given you its life so that you can continue to live. And here it is. And it's in this cup, and it's the cup of Christ. It's not just the cup of any ordinary lamb, generically speaking. Only the blood of Christ can do this for you. There is no other way. There is no other lamb. There is no other sacrifice. You have to understand these things as we're going through this. There is no life in any other. And I hope you can see a little bit of what Christ is doing here this whole entire time leading up to this point. That Jesus is fully aware of what is about to happen. He knows the cross is just hours away. And he's bravely moving toward that and explaining this is what's going to happen. And these events are going to make a lot more sense to you in the next 24 hours. But he's not running from them. He's explaining them and illustrating them. He says, I'm going to go through this and you're going to do these things with this, this, this act that used to foreshadow. I'm kind of reimagining this and, it's, and you're going to see the better, real, fuller picture of all this. And you should do this forever until I return. So you can remember these events that are going to unfold. He's fully aware of what's going on. And he's moving toward it. Toward a humiliating and painful sacrifice. Because that's what heroes do. They don't run. And he's not arrogant as he does this, as we would probably be tempted to be. He's confident, but not in himself. He's confident in his Father. You think about the prayers that Jesus is offering, praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, looking at the cross, and the conversations, and the comments that he makes as he's hanging on the cross. He's confident in the Father. He's confident in God. You see the difference that that makes here. And this is when it comes to the fourth cup. And it's a cup he never drinks. Now, I don't know what that exactly looked like in that Passover meal. If he just talked about it and the disciples drank it and he didn't, I don't know. But he never drinks the fourth cup. Why not? Because he made a promise. He will drink it, but not now. Later. It's at the marriage supper of the Lamb. I won't drink of the fruit of the vine again until I drink it new in the kingdom of God. I'm going to drink it. He's so confident. He's so confident in the Father. He's so confident of getting through this, of rising again, that he can put the fourth cup down and says, I'll be back for it later. He knows what's coming. But it's at the marriage supper of the Lamb. And that fourth cup, if you remember, you will be my people and I will be your God, and it will be fully realized then. It's true now. Fully realized then. It's the fourth cup, and he sets it down. Jesus is the hero. And the disciples don't realize any of this yet. They will, but they don't know any of this yet. But it's important that they understand, because they are so overconfident right now in themselves, more so than God or Jesus or anybody else. So overconfident in their abilities, so overconfident in their steadfastness, so overconfident in just who they are. But that's going to change so quickly in just a matter of hours. Jesus is bravely moving towards the cross, and they're about to cower before a chicken. And Jesus is going to warn them first, even. He's going to tell them, this is what's happening, this is what's coming, and you're still going to fail. And they don't believe him. But let's read verses 26 through 31. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives, and Jesus said to them, You will fall away, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. And Peter said to them, Even though all fall away, I will not. And Jesus said to him, Truly I tell you this very night, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. But he said emphatically, If I must die with you, I will not deny you. And they all said the same thing. It's cowardice before a chicken. You're no hero. That's really what it boils down to. You know, they're leaving here. They sing this hymn. It's not identified for us, but again, in keeping with the Hallel and the, and, the, and the typical structure of a Passover, probably Psalm 118. Can't be certain of that, but probably. And then they just depart to the Mount of Olives, which is honestly, it's just outside of Jerusalem. You see where the temple is. It's just kind of, uh, we don't know exactly where they were in Jerusalem, but the temple's here, and, and the Mount of Olives is right there on the side. It's not far. They're just going to go out there. They're going to spend some time in the Garden of Gethsemane. They're going to pray. They're going to enjoy some time together. But Jesus is not one to skip over a teachable moment, and he's not going to do that here. It's not just something Jesus, uh, and, and he tells him here, you guys are going to abandon me. And it's not just something that Jesus just knows. 
It's actually prophesied. This, this little bit of a passage, you probably have it maybe in brackets. Sometimes they capitalize. Depends on, you know, that. But in verse 27, uh, it says, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. That's a quotation from Zechariah 13, 7. The disciples falling away was, was uh, prophesied. It was foretold in Scripture a long time ago. The father in this case, he's going to strike the shepherd, Jesus, and the disciple, the, the sheep, the disciples are going to scatter. They're going to run. And they did. It's crazy to me to think about the fact that this is prophesied. Hundreds of years prior to all this happening, the, the defection and the falling away and the failure of the disciples in this key moment is prophesied. And they have no idea they're about to fulfill the prophecy. And Jesus is telling them ahead of time, and he's warning them. And it doesn't do them any good. They're going to face some opposition, and they're going to run. Now, this is not the same thing as what Judas does. And I think that's important that we take note of this here, because Judas, in, in his betrayal of Jesus, abandons Jesus very willingly. It's an internal abandoning. It's something that he wanted to do. In other words, he was very active in his walking or running away from Jesus. It's very different. The disciples, interestingly enough, the, the falling away here, the scandalizing is literally the, the, the Greek behind it there, is it, it's passive. In other words, something happens to them to push them. Well, what happened to them? They were just afraid. They were afraid. Judas betrays Jesus for money. The disciples betray Jesus because they were afraid. They were afraid of what's going on. And I think, honestly, this is where a lot of us live every day. We're afraid. And the following away that we do here happens to them and it happens to us because something externally happens and drives us away. It, 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 we cower before it. We're afraid. They and we need to be watchful and prepared because it doesn't make it right and it doesn't make it okay, but it does make it different. But I think rarely are we actually prepared for this because we become so overconfident in our ability to stand and our ability to resist and our ability to overcome. And so often the sins that we commit here that fall in these categories are because we're overconfident in this, that it's our due to our own weakness and our refusal to trust Christ the way that we ought to. And we fail so often in the Christian life. We're just simply afraid, which means we never plan to do this. Judas did. We're not planning to fail. We're not planning to fall short. We don't want it. We want to be faithful. We want to, we want to go to the end. We want to be that, what Christ wants us to be. And yet sometimes in the moments we come paralyzed by our own fear of what's going to happen and what's going on here, and we run. And then we hang our heads in shame and feel defeated over what's going on here. That's where the disciples lived, where we are too. Because I think so often we're so much more confident in our abilities and our strength than in God's. But here's a promise to grace to you that's easy to miss. I missed it until it dawned on me as I was reading this over and over again. But it's a promise. Notice in, in verse uh, 28, but after I'm raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. That doesn't seem like much. But it is a promise. And it is a promise. One, of course, after, not if, but after I'm raised up. But he says, I'll meet you in Galilee. It's after their abandonment. He's going to go and he's going to lead them again. He's going to go and, and, and find them again. It's kind of like the, the, the prodigal son who leaves his father, kind of basically says, I wish you were dead, goes off, does his own thing. What does the father in that story do? He doesn't just sit on the couch and like, oh, well, whatever. Every day. He goes out, and he doesn't just look out the window. Every day he goes out, and he goes down like, to the end of the driveway, maybe even the end of town, and he looks for his son. He goes to him. And then finally that one day he sees his son coming in here, and he goes, and he runs, which it was humiliating for a father to do in those days. It was shameful in that regard. He didn't care. He runs to his son, and he welcomes him home. He's looking for him. He's looking to restore his son. You want to put it in a different metaphor. Jesus there, the shepherd, going after the wayward sheep, bringing them back to the fold. It's what Jesus does here, and it's in Galilee. They're in Jerusalem. They're supposed to stay in Jerusalem until Pentecost. They didn't do that. But he goes and he finds them in Galilee because Peter's like, I'm going to go fishing, John 21. I'm going to go fishing. Jesus goes and he finds them, and he restores them to right fellowship with him. But he's there. 
I, don't, I, I think that's amazing. I hope that's encouraging to you. Jesus goes looking for them to bring them back. And when we fail, God searches for you to bring you back and restore you. Now keep in mind here as we go this, that the real, a genuine son or daughter is not looking to run away from God and think, it'll be fine. A real, a genuine son and daughter doesn't seek to hurt their parents. Now, is that going to happen sometimes? Sure. But they're not looking to do that. There's a huge difference there. It will happen, but that's not their plan. A genuine son and genuine daughter are looking and they're responding to the love that, that the parent has for them. And they, their greatest desire in life is to please them. And our greatest desire in this life should be to please and honor our loving Heavenly Father. Not to break relation. What do you think of God so loving? Then why does he bring these hardships and difficult times in our lives? That's a fair question. I think the easiest answer, or maybe not the easiest, but the first answer has to be, I don't know. I don't know your specific situation, and I really want to be cautious before going over that and just throwing something out there. Well, it must be for this. I don't know. Maybe you'll figure it out, maybe you won't. But I think an additional thing is, you know, just understand, Jesus loves the disciples, and he does not keep them from hardship. And they're kind of important. I think it's Ephesians, talks about the fact that they're going to lay the very foundations of the church. Christ, of course, being that cornerstone, but they're going to lay the foundations of the church. And where do we find them here? In trials and suffering. He doesn't keep them from it. He's invested so much in that, and yet they are not kept from these things. They had a lot of things to learn, but they're not kept. C.S. Lewis was also often fond of saying, and it's a longer quote, but God shouts to us in our pain. They've got a lot of lessons to learn, and they're not, le they're not learning them. And he puts them through the ringer here just a little bit, and they start to appreciate humility. They start to appreciate dependency on God. They start learning to understand a little bit more of their own limitations and false confidence. They're all things that we still need to this day. But this becomes a huge turning point for the disciples, and it comes through suffering, hardship, trial, and humiliation. Do you think maybe some of the things that we go through in life are not to teach us some of those very same things? No, you might not be convinced. And that's fair, because Peter wasn't either. If you look at, look at this, what, what does he say? Verse 29, Peter said to him, even though they all fall away, he's pointing to his fellow disciples there, I will not. No way. Never happening. Boy, was he mistaken. No matter what else everybody else does, I will be there. I'll be the exception. I'll be the exception. I think a lot of us can think that too. I'll be the exception. That won't happen to me. I'll be exempt from this. And you don't know that. You know, in life, you realize some people are just not good learners. There are some people you can come over and you can talk to them and say, if you don't do that, and they never will. They'll never push the boundaries. They'll never touch. They won't touch. You tell them, don't touch the stove, and they just, they just won't. And there's other kids that will not learn until they touch it. Right? You just you try and try and try, and you, they just they make it a beeline over there, and they're going to touch it. They're just going to reach out, and you're like, it's going to hurt, and they don't care. They just, you know, and there it is. But you know what? They've learned, and they never do it again. Peter's one of those hot stove kind of guys. You know, Peter's always going to burn, and probably his hand, you know, his whole hand, burn it, but then he learns it, and he gets it, and they're forever changed from this moment forward. Mark records for us here a little bit that he says the, the, the cock is going to crow twice. Mark's the only one to record that. And everybody else just says the cock is going to crow before you deny me three times. I, I think maybe Mark is recording this for us a little bit because this is Peter's, what almost everybody agrees, Peter's direct account to Mark to write down. That it was twice and there was, there was a warning in there. He was going to deny him a couple of times and the cock was going to crow and it was going to serve as Peter as a warning. Remember what Jesus says. You can stop right here, right now. And he completely ignores it and does it again anyway. That's what he did. He denied Jesus before a chicken. Peter, you're so sure of yourself and you shouldn't be. You're so self-confident and you shouldn't be. You have no idea what's coming around the corner. You're trying to face it all alone. You're going to fail. And he's not convinced and he's not alone. Because look, the last verse. 
He says, if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And they all said the same. They're all in the same boat. They're maybe not as vocal as Peter is, but they're all in the same boat. There's no way that's going to happen. And by morning, they're all gone. All of them. James Edwards, commentator, said this powerfully. He said, the Last Supper is attended by traitors and cowards. It is a table not of merit, but of grace. I don't think anything has changed. You know, the reality is that we do not know what tomorrow is going to be like. We can feel and stand here or sit here and be so confident, feel so confident in our own strength, our own abilities, that we've never faced anything in life that we could not conquer, that we could not get over, that we could not endure, but you do not know what tomorrow holds. The disciples were in that same boat. They thought, we can make it, we can conquer, we can do these things. They did not know what the next several hours was going to hold for them. And it was far more than they could ever fathom, and they ran. See, we never know what tomorrow's going to bring. We don't even know what t- this afternoon's going to bring. And it's not to encourage you to live in absolute fear and terror. It's an encouragement for you to look up to God and say, God, I can't do this if I don't have you by my side. And put your confidence not in yourself, which is where the disciples' confidence was, but in God Almighty. Because you're going to get wrecked. Something's going to happen to you, and it's going to strip you of all your confidence, all your your arrogance, and you're going to be sitting there on your knees going, what happened? I thought I was prepared. I thought I was ready. I thought I could do everything. And you might not be able to think of a scenario that's going to strip you or could do that that you can't handle, but God can. And he might do that very thing to humble you, to spare you, and break you of that confidence the disciples were so guilty of. It's a call really for humility. Disciples need to learn that, and so do we. The reality is that so many of us, we're convinced of our own merit. We're convinced of our own goodness. And really, none of us are really good at all. You can't do it for yourself what Christ, only Christ can do for you. They need to learn that. Again, this is not a table of merit, but of grace. That we come to the Lord's table. We come to church every week. And it's not to pat ourselves on the back to talk about how great we are or how far we've come because it doesn't work. It's where we all come and say how desperate we all are. We need Jesus, not just for salvation. It starts there, but it's not just for salvation, but it's to do the Christian life. Are you recognizing Jesus as the hero or not? Because it's not just for salvation, but it's for all of life. We need Jesus to be our hero. And you never outgrow your need for his grace Ever. If anything else, you should simply be growing in your awareness of your need of it. And I hope you are. Jesus is the hero, not you. I, I think this was a lot of fun to go through. I really enjoy going through the Passover, just understanding that a little bit, connecting some of the dots for the Old Testament places and things. Normally don't focus on those so much. But I think more powerfully and importantly than all of that is the fact of how easy it is for me to overvalue my accomplishments, my abilities, my gifts, the things that I think I'm really good at or can do. I want to be the hero in life. And the reality, and and here, let me, like, I want to be the hero in, in, in this weird way, and I think you'll, you have to rework this for yourself, but for me as a pastor, and, and you're coming in here, you know, I want to be the hero. I want you to come to me, and I want to be, as your counselor, give you something that walks away that changes your life. I want to be the guy that you come into and you're thankful for because you're like, man, I never saw that before. You've got such great spiritual insight. I want to be the one that saves your marriage. I want to be the one that's there for you and encourages you. And you're like, man, pastor, I, I don't know what I would have done if you hadn't given me that ride. You hadn't done that. I want to be the hero. I'm not a good person. And for each and every one of us, we have to look in the mirror and say, how do I want to be a hero? How do you want to be a hero? What are you hoping for in life? 
Because I think all of us come to grips with some aspects as, you know, I want to be a hero too. I want people to think a certain way of me. I want them to look at me a certain way. I want them to need me and depend upon me. It's wrong. Jesus is the hero, not you, not me. Throw out your cape. You're not a hero. Only Jesus. And if you don't know Christ as your Savior, then you understand that you're doubly trying to be your own hero. That you approach this table every week or every time you've come, if you've ever done it, and you're saying, I'm coming by my own merit, my gifts, my abilities. Look at what I have done. And there are so many people both in and out of the church that they're, kind of, they're trying to come to God and they're trying to look and do so on their own merit and say, look at me, value my work and my abilities and my effort. It has no value. It has no value in the eyes of God. I think all of us do that from time to time. We convince ourselves, I'm great. We convince ourselves of something that we're special. And when we do, we have to realize that Jesus is going to come to your Galilee. He's going to humble you, but he's also promising, I'll meet you over here. When you've got this figured out, when you realize how bad you failed, and I'll restore you and I'll bring you back. But the journey back might be a very hard one. It was for the disciples. It was painful. It was hard. It was humiliating. Whichever camp you happen to be in, if you are still in need of Christ as a Savior, please come. Just talk to me. Talk to somebody. Look, what does it mean to be saved? How can Christ be my hero? And if you're continually going through this life and, and, and thinking, okay, I'm in Christ, but I still want people to think much of me. I'm still trying to be a hero in other ways. Please, please, please learn the lesson that the, the disciples did. It was hard and it was painful, but I think they would all tell you it was worth it. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, I do thank you for this day that you have given to me, to us. to be able to look through, think through your word. Lord, the timing of this could not be better as far as our perspective goes and just looking at the Passover coming up. And I do hope next Saturday when we're just doing our own thing and it dawns on us that we might reflect once again on this passage. Like, oh yeah, it's Passover. Think again about the promises and the events that went down this particular Passover. All the symbolism, all the meaning, all the significance, that we would appreciate this in a whole new way and in a whole new light. Remembering again what it is that you accomplished for us on the cross as that perfect lamb that we celebrate with a broken piece of bread because the sacrifice and the repetition is no more. Truly, it is finished. And Lord, for us as we go through this life, again, being aware, fully aware of our need of grace, that we are not capable of doing this by ourselves, I just really enjoy the contrast between these two groups, your son and the disciples, and the way that they approach the following hour, some of them in, in uh, arrogance and some of them in knowledge, but, Lord, it does detail the way in which we often approach the future that is unknown to us and how arrogantly we can do it sometimes, thinking, oh, I got this, when we don't. Lord, I do pray if there is anyone in this room this morning that does not know you as their Savior, that today would be the day that that changes. I pray that you would give them a boldness to ask the questions that need to be asked. Lord, for the rest of us, that we might go from this place leaning heavily on you, realizing that we go by grace, not by our abilities. In Christ's name, amen.